again. We're in 1 Samuel 14 today. And I want us to remember where we've been. So we were talking about um, Saul's general attitude towards God and what might be revealed about that in 1 Samuel 13 and his, uh, his sin with the sacrifice. And some of the things that we said on Thursday, we're going to see developed more fully over the course of chapter 14 today. One of the things we need to remember uh, as we're going into chapter 14 is that uh, this chapter is going to continue the same military campaign that we read about in chapter 13. All right, so chapter 14, verse 1 is going to say, you know, one day Jonathan did this, that, and the other thing, like a lot of time has passed, but they are still in the same place, right? They are just where we left them at the end of chapter 13. Uh, so at the end of 1 Samuel 13, we read that, uh, you know, that Saul and Jonathan are at... Uh, They've been hanging around Geba and Gibeah, whereas the Philistines go to Michmash, and that's where we're going to find them here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Um, and so the things that we've been talking about in 13, we're going to see develop over the course of 14. So one thing I wanted to start with that we didn't get to on Thursday night um, is a, a consequence of Saul's rejection. Um, that goes beyond Saul, right? This is, we said that Saul, uh, Saul serves as a, a lesson for us in a lot of ways, right? That he shows that, um, you know, he shows that it's possible to fall away. Um, he shows that it's possible to basically to fake your religious devotion. Uh, but one of the other things that he shows is that the consequences of sin you know, radiate out. Like, they don't just affect you, right? Saul is not the only person who has to suffer on uh, account of his sin in chapter 13. And I want us to see the way that Samuel develops this. Um, we noted, I guess it was last week, you go, to, go to the beginning of chapter 13. I want us to see this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll start in verse 1. 1 Samuel 13, verse 1. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. All right, so in those couple of verses there, we learn a couple of things about Jonathan. We learn that he has a third of Saul's fighting force under him. And we learn that he's apparently pretty intrepid himself because he goes out and defeats this uh, garrison of the Philistines at Geba. What do we not learn about Jonathan? That we would, we might expect the text to tell us that he is Saul's son, right? Like this is just something that we know, you know, because you know everybody knows that Jonathan is the son of Saul. But he's not initially introduced in that way. Samuel withholds that from us just for a little bit um, because he shows us this apparently great guy uh, who is again commander over a third of the fighting force, um, who takes this initiative upon himself, who is, at least as far as we've seen him up to this point, pretty impressive. And then we see Saul's sin, and Samuel comes to him and proclaims in verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. And we, un we need to understand the significance of that. When Samuel tells Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. 
Right? He's not referring to the kingdom of Israel. Israel's going to continue as a kingdom. And he's not just referring to Saul's reign. Right? I mean, Saul's reign obviously is going to come to an end. But that's, not, that's actually not going to happen for a long time. All right, the rest of this book, Saul is still going to be king. So what's Samuel referring to when he says, now your kingdom shall not continue? He's referring to Saul's... Well, what, what do you expect to happen whenever one king passes on? Who becomes king next? His son. This is the way that all monarchies work. They're dynastic. All right, so the, the king passes his kingdom along to his children, usually to his oldest son. And Saul, sorry, Samuel has just proclaimed to Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. In other words, you will not have a dynasty. You are not going to leave your kingdom to the person after you. And it's only after that, in fact, it's very soon after that, in verse 16, that we learn Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And there, for the first time, Samuel identifies Jonathan as Saul's son. So right after showing us that Saul is not going to leave a dynasty, he then turns around and tells us who is getting cut out. And again, this tells us about the consequences of sin. And the weight of the tragedy of Saul can really begin to settle on us now, because it's not just that Saul, who had so much promise, has turned out badly. The consequences are more long-lasting even than that. If Saul had been a better man, if he had lived up to his promise, Israel could have had a King Jonathan. And as we're going to continue to read, a King Jonathan looks very attractive in this book. In fact, we're going to see, well, there's a reason why Jonathan and David end up being best friends. We're going to see that they are very much alike. Um, and if Israel had had a King Jonathan, just based on the things that were told about him in this book, it seems like Israel would be doing pretty well off. But because of Saul, there will be no King Jonathan. So as we continue the story, the idea of the King Jonathan that could have been should haunt us because Israel is never going to get him. Uh, and that's one of the first things that chapter 14 is going to develop for us. We're going to continue to see how impressive Jonathan is. So, with that groundwork laid, let's go ahead and pray together, and we'll begin chapter 14. Righteous Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together this morning to study from your word. We pray that you'll be with us, bless us. Help us to discern your intent in recording these things. Help us, Father, to learn from the stories that we read. Help us to be more effective servants in your kingdom, obedient and faithful to you, penitent whenever we sin. We pray, Father, that you reveal our sins to us. And, Father, we know that you are righteous and just to forgive us as we confess our sins before you and repent of them. We pray for true penitence. We thank you, Father, for the gifts that you've given us in your Son, that we can be forgiven of our sins, and that we have an eternal hope in his new life, and we eagerly await his return. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so, okay, so we're going to see some things develop over the course of chapter 14 that we saw started in chapter 13. Um, because things are going to play out roughly in the same way, right? We saw this basic structure to the plot in chapter 13 that the Philistines show up and Saul is hopelessly outnumbered and he makes some religious-looking gestures uh, that result in his condemnation. And what we're going to see is roughly the same kind of structure here, repeating similar things. And this is pretty common for, for Scripture. 
Right? This is just a general note on how we study Scripture, how we understand Scripture. Um, that some of the things that you know we start to hear in one place, we will usually hear again in another place. Or the Bible repeats itself uh, to develop our understanding of things, the other ideas or people. Um, and that's something that we need to pay attention to. So we're going to start with what kind of man Jonathan is, and then we're going to hear uh, Saul's rejection developed over the course of this chapter. We'll learn more about his character. So let's begin with the first three verses of chapter 14. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Right, so this chapter starts by announcing to us that there's going to be a divided plot, meaning that the, the story's going to go in two different threads. We're going to follow two different stories in this chapter. First, you've got Jonathan and his young man um, who are going to go attack the Philistines. And we'll see what comes of that in a little bit. Um, Then you also have Saul and the rest of the army who stay behind in the camp. In fact, they don't even know that Jonathan uh, and, uh, and his young man are going out on this escapade. Uh, we will see a separate plot thread for them. But in this, in this opening, we learn that somebody is with Saul. Who is with Saul here at Gibeah in this battle? Ahijah. Who is Ahijah? Because Samuel actually tells us a lot about Ahijah. Yeah, he is related to to Phinehas. Yeah, he is the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas. We've we've already met Ichabod, at least baby Ichabod. Remember, it means the glory has departed. Um, So Ahijah is Phinehas' grandson, which makes him great-grandson of Eli. And we also learn in that verse that Ahijah is wearing an ephod. What's it mean that he's wearing an ephod? What's that supposed to signify to us? Yeah, he is a priest, or he's acting as a priest. Now, what's the significance of that? That this particular guy is acting as a priest. What do we already know about the house of Eli? Yeah, they, they have been cut off from the priesthood. Right? Eli was rejected. Now that's the opening part of the book. So, And it's, it's like with Saul. Not just Eli himself, but his whole household. They are cut off from the priesthood. They are rejected. And that's a good question. Yeah, what's he doing there wearing an ephod? In fact... There's the book of Samuel has been pretty quiet about the house of Eli, just like it's been quiet about Shiloh all this time. What have they been up to? Have they been acting as priests the whole time? Um, the text doesn't tell us. Instead, at this moment, it chooses to bring Ahijah back out for us, you know, a descendant of Eli back out for us, and to tell us that he is acting as a priest. And we'll see that made very explicit later in the chapter. And we're supposed to ask that kind of question. Like, wait a minute, what's he doing acting as a priest? And it makes, well, it's no coincidence that Samuel does this now at this point in the book. Samuel, the narrator, I mean. Um, That immediately after we hear of Saul's rejection, we find him associated with a priest from the rejected house of Eli. All right, we're going to see what comes of that. That'll be part of, uh, of Saul's thread in the, uh, the story this morning. So we're going to see what happens with Jonathan and what happens with Saul. And Samuel, by the way, in telling us these two different plots side by side, 
in the same chapter. He's going to use these as a contrast to help us understand Saul's shortcomings and why he is being rejected as king. This contrast between Saul and Jonathan is also, by the way, going to deepen the tragedy of that rejection because, again, we're going to hear what kind of man Israel is losing by not getting King Jonathan. So let's continue. Uh, Verse 4, we'll read a little bit more this time. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Seneth. And the other crag, and sorry, the one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. And Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden themselves. The men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. We'll show you a thing. Jonathan said to his armor uh, armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which which Jonathan and his armor-bearer made killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. All right, so the story shows us Jonathan first. Now, how would we characterize Jonathan's attitude uh, in this bit of the story, especially his faith? Sorry, what was that? Solid? Okay, what, what indicates that to us? Uh, what, uh, what kinds of things indicate that Jonathan's faith seems solid? All right, he puts his trust in the Lord. Right, we can see uh, that at the end of verse 6, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Okay. All right, so yeah, he, he establishes a sign, and it, it might strike us as kind of odd, um, there are a few different ways that we might take this. So, so Jonathan comes up with this sign that, okay, we're going to show ourselves to the Philistines, and if they say, you wait there and we'll come down to you, well then, you know, we're not going to do anything. But if they say, come up to us, then we will know uh, that the Lord has given them into our hand. All right, what's, what's going on here? Does he have some kind of prophetic knowledge or... Uh, or something else going on. The text doesn't clarify for us. Uh, my hunch is that Jonathan is basically paying attention to see if things go well for them or not. Right? Because remember, the Philistines are... I mean, the, well, the text has laid out, the, I guess, the topography for us. Um, and the Philistines have the high ground. So they not only have this enormous numerical advantage, they also have... The, the positional advantage. And if they keep that advantage, right, wait until we come to you, right, where they're going to be approaching Jonathan and his armor bearer from the high ground so that they can attack from above. Well, things pretty obviously are not going Jonathan's way. Whereas if they give up that advantage, you come up to us, 
well, then things are going Jonathan's way. And what Jonathan is doing here is trusting that things will continue to go his way. In other words, like if, if the Lord signals to us that he's with us in this first step, then that's our proof that he's going to be with us the rest of the way too. doesn't necessarily mean that he has to be a prophet or anything. Uh, it just shows us the nature of Jonathan's faith. That I want to go do this thing, um, and if the Lord wants me to do it, I'm going to be able to do it. Nobody's going to stop me from doing it. Um, and the sign of that, how I'm going to figure out whether the Lord is with me or not, is if I enjoy some success at the first step. Um, now, granted, that's not exactly the, the kind of advice that I would necessarily give someone today, right? Like, if you're thinking about doing something and you're successful at the very beginning, well, that must mean that God is with you. Um, but here, at least in Jonathan's case, we can see, well, that, let, let me ask it this way. Does Jonathan turn out to be right? I mean, it's pretty clear that the Lord is with him. Samuel doesn't have to come out and say it explicitly, but what's, what's the evidence that we have that the Lord is with him? The result, which includes some specifically well, things that strike us as supernatural, not just that Jonathan is able to win this battle against 20 guys, which is impressive enough by itself, um, but the fact that this panic falls on the Philistines and even the earth quakes, right? Which seems like very convenient timing right, if God's not involved in this. I, I think Samuel means for us to understand that you know, the earthquake has come from the Lord. So Jonathan turns out to be right. Uh, there's one other thing, by the way, that I want us to notice about Jonathan's attitude and his faith. Uh, in this, is Jonathan presuming on the Lord's favor? Does he, does he just assume, like, I, I want to go do this thing, and the Lord is going to be with me on this? Well, what does he say uh, to his armor bearer at the beginning of verse 6? Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, it may be that the Lord will work for us. All right, I think that's pretty essential for Jonathan, or for understanding Jonathan's faith, is that Jonathan gives agency to the Lord. Right? He recognizes that the Lord is going to do what the Lord wants to do, and he's not going to you know, twist the Lord's arm into making him you know, do whatever he wants him to do. Um, so he leaves the the choice up to God. And he's just trying to uh, interpret what God's choice is. That's going to be important, especially as we contrast Saul later on. Um, so Jonathan's plan works. And by the way, remember Jonathan, and this is another aspect of his faith, Jonathan attributes that to the Lord, right? Come up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Um, and we see his success. Right? He joins the Philistines in combat. He wins an impressive victory. Panic arises in the Philistine camp, which is the kind of thing that we have seen God do before. Right? It might make you think of the Gideon story, for example. Um, so, And again, the, the text is going to be explicit about this later on in the chapter, but at this point, like we said, we can clearly see who's really winning the battle here. It's not just Jonathan winning the battle, uh, but the Lord winning the battle. All right, any questions or comments on that section of the text before we continue on? Yes, faith is not just an assumption. Yes. Yes, so Jonathan acts, he puts his trust in the Lord. All right, so he's, he's not passive in things. Um, he is not presumptuous on things. And at the same time, he's also not assuming things. All right, he, he starts to act, but he's also 
keeping an eye on things, as it were, right? He's, he's evaluating things as they go along. Uh, because, again, he's not going to assume that, uh, all right, the Lord is going to do what I want him to do. So, very good. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So, next, the perspective shifts to Saul and the camp of Israel. Verse 16. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there, then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark, uh, for the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow, and there was very great confusion. Now the, Philist is now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned out to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth -Haven. All right, so, and by the way, since we had just noted this, here the, the text tells us explicitly, the Lord saved Israel that day. All right, so the results of all of this come from the hand of the Lord. All right, so things have shifted to Saul's perspective now. He sees that there's distress in the Philistine camp, and he assumes that somebody from the Israelite side is responsible, or at least gone. Um, but he doesn't know about Jonathan's plan, like Samuel told us at the beginning. Um, so he has the people numbered to figure out who's missing, who's left from us. And then we get this strange note, all right, after he has found out that Jonathan and his armor bearer are the ones who are not there. In verse 18, Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. All right, well, when was the last time that we saw the ark in this book? You all remember? You remember there was that, that infamous occasion where the Philistines captured the ark? Right? You've got that whole drama with Dagon, you know, falling on his face and needing to be dusted off and set back up. And, um, you've got his head and arms falling off. And instead of taking the hint, the Philistines uh, continue to act like everything's normal. In fact, they step over the spot where Dagon's head was because it's holy ground. Um, but then eventually after all of that, after the Philistines eventually figure out that they need to restore the ark to Israel. Remember, they uh, they send the the ark on an ox cart um, up to Israel, and Israel receives it. And what do they do with it? Do they take it back to the tabernacle at Shiloh, or do they do something else with it? Yes, yeah, they store it at. Um, Oh, his name has left my head now. It's the beginning of chapter 7. Um, Abinadab, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's stored at Abinadab's house in Kiryat Yarim, which is just kind of an, like a random odd corner of Israel. It's, it's not Shiloh. It's not really even close to Shiloh. Um, and we, we noted that that whole scenario was already kind of weird. Uh, because we don't know anything about Abinadab. We have no idea if he is one of the sons of Aaron, if he's even a Levite at all. Um, but they take and consecrate his son Eleazar to have charge of the Ark of the Lord. And that's the last that we saw of the Ark. The Ark was lodged at Kiryat Yerim. Um, and this is the only little note that we're going to get about the Ark here until 2 Samuel 6 whenever David goes to fetch the ark from
from Abinadab's house in Kiriath Yerim uh, to bring the ark down to Jerusalem. So we know at some point the ark is going to go back to Kiriath Yerim. Yet for some reason here, it's at Michmash Pass. And I think there's a reason for it because what does, what does this remind us of whenever Saul says to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here? We've heard that language before in this book. We were just talking about it on Thursday. The elders of Israel, back in chapter 4, that's what they had said whenever they first lost the battle against the Philistines. Uh, the elders of Israel, their idea was, all right, we'll bring the ark here and the Lord will win for us. All right, so Samuel is, I think, pretty intentionally reminding us of that episode with Saul in the place of the elders. Because I mean, we know how badly that turned out. Right? And we know why it turned out that badly. Right? That they are, they're treating the ark as a talisman. Right? They're going to force God to go out into the battle with them and win for them. Obviously, it ends disastrously for them because they're not going to make God do anything. And now here, Saul says the same words that they said, bring the ark of God here. And this is the only time that we're going to see the ark during Saul's entire reign. Uh, again, all the way up until 2 Samuel 6. So we need to pay attention to how he treats the ark. Um, how he treats things. Uh, let's see. Now, again, for what purpose he brings the ark up? The text doesn't say. Is he planning on taking it out into battle? Is he planning on offering worship? Is he planning on trying to consult with the Lord there? We have no idea. There's only one thing that we see him do with the ark. And it's at the end of verse 19. What does he tell to Ahijah? Withdraw your hand. All right. Whatever Ahijah was doing with the ark, again, we're not told what Saul wanted with the ark, but whatever he was doing with it, Saul says, stop, quit. I want us to pay attention. What triggers that? What makes Saul say, all right, stop what you're doing. All right, because all right, he has seen that there is tumult in the Philistine camp. He has learned that Jonathan and his armor bearer are gone. He has the ark brought forward. And Saul is conversing with the priest, consulting with him about something. And the priest is doing something with the ark. But then what, do, what happens? What does Saul see? that causes him to tell Ahijah, withdraw your hand. It's there in the middle of verse 19. Yeah, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. And so suddenly Saul says to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. All right, yeah, Joe. Yes, yeah, the, uh, the old Greek of this has uh, Ahijah bringing forward the ephod um, and doing something with the ephod. That's, it's possible. The, the Hebrew text tells us that it's the ark, and ark is the more difficult reading here, which is usually the reading that we stick with, usually the reading we prefer. Uh, whenever there's a difference that big between the Hebrew and the Greek. Um, in other words, it would make sense for a Greek translator to look at this and say, oh, no, there's no way the ark was there. They actually meant ephod, right, and change that. Um, it makes more sense for that to happen than for the original text to have been the ephod was there, and then some Hebrew scribe later down the line says, no, I think we're going to bring the Ark of God here. Right? Like this, one of those changes is a lot more uh, understandable than the other. Uh, Wayne? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the narrator feels the need to explain why Saul has called the Ark up. And that apparently at that time, that's something that is going on. Um, now, again, Samuel doesn't tell us any more about that um, outside of this battle. Like, what were they doing carrying the Ark around? Uh, what did God think of that? Uh, he doesn't tell us anything about that. Um Sorry, say again. Yes, we're actually going to see that in this chapter uh, because they're going to try to use the uh, the stones, the Urim and the Thummim from the ephod uh, to get an answer from the Lord on something. Um, and so that's possibly one of the things that Saul has been uh, asking Ahijah to do here. Right, Bring the ark up. We're going to consult with God. Um but again, for, for whatever reason, Samuel withholds that from us and only tells us that whatever they were doing, suddenly Saul has him stop so that they can do what instead? Go into battle. All right, They were going to do something with the Ark of God, but instead they're going to rush into the battle because they have heard the tumult in the camp of the Philistines. Mm-hmm. He's about to consult God I, again. We're yeah, we're not told explicitly what happens, but go ahead. Yeah, in, in let's lay it out this way: in every possible case of what we think they might be doing with the ark, whether it would be uh, consulting with God, yeah, like through the Urim and Thummim, um, or getting ready to offer sacrifice. Those are things that you would typically find happening before a battle, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know, we're not told here. Uh, we don't have anybody die from it, so I assume that they've got to be carrying it by the poles. <laughs> In some way or another, they get the ark there, and, and they're not nuked for it. But it is, a, it is an odd note, because we know what's going to happen with the ark later on, yeah, whenever Uzzah touches it. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, how are, they, how are they doing this? Again, Samuel withholds a lot of things from us that we would, like, we'd really love to hear, right? This is a lot of curious stuff going on here. Like, how are they moving the ark around? What are they doing with it? Instead, he focuses our attention. The only thing that he tells us is that whatever they started doing, Saul sees that the distress in the Hebrew, er, sorry, in the Philistine camp increases more and more as the Philistines are, you know, they start out in trouble, seemingly, and then it becomes clear they're in really bad trouble. Ahijah, stop what you're doing. Everybody, we're going to go rush into the battle. Does that suggest anything to us about the way that Saul what Saul's priorities are in the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm hmm. All right, and I think that's, I've heard two comments. His focus is the battle, right? And I think that's, that seems to be what's going on here. His real priority is fighting the Philistines and winning. Where does he put the worship of God or consulting God or any of the interactions that he could have with God? Where does that seem to fall on his list of priorities? It's somewhere down the line. <laughs> it is, that comes, yeah, that comes after winning the battle, seemingly. Yeah. Yeah, he's put the priests in jeopardy. Um, he has probably put himself in jeopardy. And it seems like 
he is he is only interested in the ark at all so long as there's any reason for him to hesitate about going into the battle. Uh, Louise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's important to note is that Ahijah here, again, it, like Louis said, is not authorized as priest to do this. He is, at this point, an illicit priest right? because the house of Eli has been rejected. Now, this is not the last that we're going to see of this kind of thing, by the way. We're going to see priests of the house of Eli continuing to act like priests for quite a while after this, e- even whenever David is king. We're going to see at least one of them. Um and so, you know, the, the whole thing is questionable from the outset, right? You've got to question Saul's motives in having this priest with him, bringing the ark out to begin with. But even at, its, even at the most charitable, even if we were to say, okay, Saul's got pure motives in bringing the ark out to begin with, it becomes clear that as soon as he sees that there's an opportunity among the Philistines, he breaks off any kind of attempted interaction with God at all. Right? The real focus is, let's get into the battle and beat the Philistines. That's what seems most important to Saul. Now, obviously, how does that compare to Jonathan's attitude in the previous scene? I mean, yeah, it's Saul's faith, <laughs> or his lack of faith, we might say. Uh, I mean, his attitude and Jonathan's attitude towards God is night and day at this point. And this develops our understanding of what was going on in chapter 13, right? where likewise, God, as Saul seems to be treating God mechanically, right? or you know, like, a, like a talisman, as we've been saying, like a pagan would treat an idol. Uh, And this is going to come through again later on in the chapter whenever they go to consult the Urim and the Thummim. Um, It all comes across as though Saul wants to get a certain outcome from God. And when he sees that he's already getting that outcome, that the Philistines are in great distress, he doesn't feel the need to bother with God at all. All But nevertheless, we read that the Lord saves Israel that day. Um, we are we're just about out of time here, and we're at the end of the section. Uh, so we'll have to save the next part of the chapter for Thursday, where we're going to see these two threads of the plot be woven together. Uh, where Saul, what Jonathan has been doing, is going to intersect with what Saul has been doing, and we're going to see how that turns out uh, and how that how that helps us to understand even more fully Saul's deficiency in his faith, in his understanding of who God is uh, and how he ought to act before God. Um, but, uh, any final questions or comments before we wrap it up this morning? Yes? That's possible. Again, Samuel, like we noticed this in chapter 13, uh, that the narrator, Samuel, um, often does not tell us a whole lot of what's going on in Saul's head and leaves us with some options to consider. Uh, Does Saul understand already that the Lord has given the battle into Israel's hand. We understand it because the narrator has told us, does Saul get it? That's a question that we need to hold on to as we continue this chapter uh, because Saul is going to do some things that I think suggest to us that he does not understand that. 
uh, at this point, that God is with them and that's why they are uh, winning things. So, but that's something good to hold on to. So thank you so much for your kind attention and your questions and comments this morning. Lord willing, we'll continue on Thursday.